A Savior is born today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Through God's grace in this Midnight Mass, we wish to find ourselves, our souls, immersed in this extravagant mood that heaven is affording us in these moments of grace. I'm going to start right now a sort of a different type of sermon than normal, which will start this, the tonight, this holy night, and will last all throughout the octave of Christmas, all my sermons to come in this next week. There'll be no exhortations, there'll be no recommendations, there'll be no commandments, but rather... I would like to just take the scholastic philosophy of a principle that is ingrained in, in Christian thought, and that is knowledge leads to love, and love leads to commitment. We cannot love anything unless we have come to know it first. So therefore, my sermons will be attempting this just to place before your eyes the beauty of these tremendous mysteries that go well beyond us and that call us from above to join these mysteries in intimate union. So my dear sisters and dear guests, of the sisters, it would be sort of a fishing exercise trying to throw you some bait with the great hope that you will bite and you will savor and you will allow divine providence to give you all the exhortations, commandments, and recommendations that only God wishes to grant to your soul. So without any further ado, I would like to start by reflecting on what this great Pope, St. Leo the Great, in his Christmas sermon, he gives us a whole uh, slew of things to think of and consider in his famous Christmas sermon that we read in Matins or you sing in Matins. A Savior is born today, he says, repeating the words of St. Luke. And then he, he says this extraordinary phrase that really puts us with much attention. He says, it is unlawful to be sad today. Even if we were going to receive a message from heaven saying that we will die tomorrow, in other words, December 26, and we were guaranteed that we will spend four millennium in purgatory, it is still unlawful for us to be sad. Now, Pope, Gregory, uh, Pope Leo the Great did not say the things about the purgatory, uh, but his absolute meaning that there is absolutely no reason to be sad, nor is it justified in any which way. And why is this? Consider these thoughts. Listen to this. It's life's birthday today. Can you imagine that? That life has a birthday. That just throws you mind-bogglingly off your rocket chair infinite life, immortal life, perfect life, perfect light being born in a valley of darkness. What does this mean? How could life, the source of all life, be born today? 
Ah, yes, this is the great mysteries. And therefore, birthday, a birthday of that life that for us mortal beings, he takes away the sting of death. Even those people who have been chasing around hospitals today, bringing their little daughters. Uh, I have an ex-parishioner who has a little daughter in the hospital tonight with tubes all over, just uh, 10 months old, near death. But this holy night dispels all of this anxiety. No matter what circumstance, because it's a birthday that brings with him the promise of eternal hereafter. And thus no one is excluded from this joy, says the great Roman pontiff, the great Saint Leo. He says, art thou a saint? Well, rejoice for thy victory is nearer. Art thou a sinner? Well, rejoice, for thy Savior pardons thee. And art thou a pagan? Well, rejoice too, for God calls thee to life. You know, if we look at the gospel, the greatest events that occurred or explained in the least amount of words. The crucifixion. We barely have a, barely a paragraph with a couple of Gospels. The most august of sacraments, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ among us, and just a few, few lines. The absolution of sins, just one line, on Easter Sunday. And so therefore, had it not been for Luke, we would not even have this description of how God became man and its circumstances. So we thank God for this message. And the first thing that we look at is we look at this divine babe. Our hearts melt with love as we see Christ in his little frame, his little body, enjoying the beatific vision, using all his human faculties of intelligence, but yet completely like a child, infant, small, and the appearance of weakness. And in that great strategizing, that divine wisdom he's already exercising, he chooses for himself, listen to us, my dear sisters, you have the vow of poverty. He chooses utter poverty for himself. He who created all the billions of acres upon the earth did not allow himself a single inch on this earth. He had to go underneath the earth into a cave made into a stable. And he clutched on to these circumstances with great enthusiasm. Because that's how he wanted to show us what he most loves and how he's going to redeem us and how he's going to save us. There was no room for him in the end. Nor will there be any room for him in all of Bethlehem. And later on, there'll be no room for him in all of Palestine. Nor yet later on, will there be any room for him in all the world. Nor later on still, will there be any room for him in the lives and the hearts of most men on earth. But I must not blame others. There's a serious question that wells up in me. Is there room for him in my heart? 
where does Christ go? But in spite of all of this, we can guess that there was a, a shelter of sorts that our Lord had. But notice that St. Luke doesn't even mention this shelter. St. Luke's lack of description would lead us to conclude that he was born in some gutter in a street, a real pauper and an outcast. But St. Luke does mention a manger, which leads us to believe that there is, was a shelter of sorts. But in the East, in those ancient customs and world, not all mangers had shelters overhead. But for the sake of firm tradition, let us be content to believe that our king had at least a stable cave in which he can be born. At least he was treated, listen to this, as well as all the cattle and not as well as ourselves. <clears throat> now, my dear sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, he is born. Christ the Lord lies helplessly unnoticed like any other infant. Let us kneel before him with Mary, with blessed Joseph, her most chaste spouse, and all the saints throughout the history of the church. In the mere sight of this little beautiful child, it satisfies the strongest cravings of the human heart, of our mind, of our hearts, of our will, of our intellects, Romans chapter 10, verse 8, listen to this. Saith the scriptures, the word is nigh to thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. St. Bonaventure, that great Franciscan theologian, recommends us, listen to this, to take this babe into our arms and nurture him, drawing him close to our bosom with utmost affection, like a St. Anthony of Padua was privileged to do. Now to sharpen those spiritual faculties, to perceive these realities, we have to have had penance and mortification during this Advent. And as we have our Lord close in our arms, may we listen to St. John in his first chapter of his, of his prologue. As many as received him, will you be willing to receive him tonight? As many as received him, to them he gave power to become sons of God. This is an apostolic Roman Catholic experience from the very apostles to be able to tangibly touch the word made flesh that dwells among us. In St. John's epistle, this is the apostolic tradition. Listen to this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen and do bear witness, and declare unto you the life eternal, which was with the Father, and hath appeared to us. That which we have seen and have heard, we declare unto you. May this holy sacrifice be, of the Mass be that instrument by which the apostles 
are handing on to us what they have handled with their hands. May we approach the communion rail with ardent love and with great expectation to receive all the inspirations, comforts, joys, and transformations that is willed by heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 